Hello, I'm Eric Snodgrass, and thank you for watching today's Ag Forecast brought to you by Nutrient Ag Solutions, your premier platform for real-time global insights. Well, over the weekend, I saw dozens of pictures from all over the world showing the Aurora Borealis, or the Northern Lights. And if you're interested in this, we, we forecast it, and it's done at NOAA's Space Weather Prediction Center. And the link to their website is up there in the upper left-hand corner. And you can get an animation like this, which shows you when and where you're going to have your best chance at seeing the Northern Lights. Well, over the weekend, I think the best place was actually in Norway. And Matt Robinson, thank you for allowing us to share this video here. You're looking here at the Aurora as he steps out of his back door. What a spectacular view. Now, since we're in Europe, I think we better talk about Europe's precipitation patterns as of late. So let's go take a look at it. Over here on the left is the last 30 days of precipitation with respect to normal. And outside of parts of Scandinavia, outside of part of the, uh, you know, the UK, much of the rest of Europe has actually been quite dry. But I would like to analyze what goes on right here inside this box, which includes the southern Russian wheat belt and also eastern Ukraine. And so the graphic over here shows the last 180 days of precipitation. Now, we've discussed the developing drought there late in the season, but I just want to keep you up to date here that even though there's been a couple of, of bigger rainfall events as of late, it's still quite dry in this region and they've built up quite a large deficit in terms of total accumulated precipitation. They're not adding much to that over the next 10 days or so. You can see that broadly across much of Europe, with the exception of right around the Mediterranean and also in the Iberian Peninsula, it's going to be relatively dry as we work our way out to the beginning of December. Now, stepping that out even further, this is looking at the whole planet, at the uh, satellite-based measurements of root zone soil moisture. And you can see here in Europe kind of the wide-scale deficits in soil moisture. Take a moment, pause the video, make sure you're looking at this in full screen, and kind of look at some other regions around the world that you might be interested in. I will talk about South America at the end of this video, but let's come back to the United States. I want to view that a little differently. Let's go right now to the latest drop monitor, which was released last Thursday. You can see that much of the western part of the United States is sitting in drought, and some of that, uh, at least a large part of that, is sitting in uh, severe to exceptional drought. And when we think about what's going on in the western United States in this upcoming winter, which for the west is the wet season, we need to be thinking about this, all right? We've seen a change in the drought monitor in the northwest, but drought has been increasing increasing in parts of the southwest, the four corner states, down here in this part of Texas. We've got some improvement from the panhandles right here through parts of the Ohio Valley and also getting into the northeast. But to really eat away at the drought in the western part of the United States, we need a pattern change, and it must change from this. And we're going to be thinking about the likelihood of that in our next few long-range updates. But what are you looking at? We're going up to the jet stream level. And anything that you see color shaded in the warm colors represents stronger than normal west to east winds. I'm talking about zonal flow. So our jet stream has really been concentrated in a pattern doing something like that. Okay. Now, this region in through here and in through here are the two areas I'm concerned about. Because what this shows me is that we have yet to see develop any sense of a strong subtropical jet stream. And it's going to be that branch of the jet stream that targets California and much of the west and southwest during winter. Without this, the chances of really recovering the precipitation in parts of the western United States and eroding away that, with that drought is relatively limited. That's not the case for the northwest, but for parts of like California, Nevada, Arizona, and other four corner states, that's going to be the trick. The same thing is going to happen for parts of the southeast. Without a strong subtropical jet stream, this winter. That's an area we're concerned about going over into drought. So let's just look now at a finer scale map showing the last 30 days of precipitation with respect to normal. So normally the subtropical jet stream would mark the beginning here of the wet season for California, but without its development things have been quite dry there. Also dry here and there is a pocket still sitting in this area that's showing up drier than normal. So again, just our last 30 days here uh, with respect to normal. Two other places I would like to point out I think what's going on up here in the Dakotas. Also, that goes into parts of southern Saskatchewan and southern Manitoba. And you can see still the extremely wet conditions here. Remember, this was back a couple of weeks ago with what was left over from Ada and that stalled out frontal boundary.
From there, let's talk about snow. This map shows you through November 22nd, accumulated snowfall departure from the 2008 to 2019 average. And so once again, I want to point out with that flow coming over in this direction, very uh, big snow so far this year in parts of the northern Rockies and the Cascades. But the deficits start in the Klamath Mountains, even though there has been some snow there lately, and coming down here into the Sierra Nevada. There's also pockets there in the central Rockies that are in deficit as well. And without any major cold air outbreak, outbreaks yet this year. Despite the fact that we have seen some lake effect snow, when we compare it to the longer term average here, we're still sitting in deficit in that particular area with respect to lake effect. Now, over the weekend, it uh, wasn't too much to talk about in terms of snow, although the latest system did clip through this part of Indiana and southern Michigan, bringing some snow, and that did get into parts of Ontario uh, as well. We might be able to see that a little bit better by looking at the last 72 hours of total accumulated precip. And as that system pulled its way uh, yesterday in through parts of Indiana, Ohio, and then eventually into this area, a lot of what you saw in here uh, did fall as either some cold rain or some heavy uh, snow at times. Now, looking at this particular map, I'd like to do a quick analysis for you. This is what the GFS model was forecasting this map to look like when you go back to last Thursday. While it did a, a, an okay job at picking up on where the precipitation was anticipated to fall out of the system, what I'd like to do is to show you why I've been favoring the European model. All right. This was the Europeans forecast of it. And what we notice here is that the European model did a much better job at picking up on the pattern, the total amount of precipitation, and, and as a result, it's been the favored model that I've been choosing as of late. The statistics show that as well. Uh, Dr. Ryan Maui produces this great plot showing us uh, how well the models have been performing. And in blue, uh, you've got the European, and in red, you have the GFS. And this is a skill map, or skill graph, excuse me. So the higher you go, the more skillful the model. And as of late, look at this. You can see the difference here between the European, which is again in blue, and the GFS, which is in red here. I'm not sure what's going on with the GFS, but its skill has really dropped off as of late. Now, the pattern we need to be discussing here is going to start with this map. It's really, we've seen a lot of the source region of our troughs coming out here uh, from parts of like the North Pacific, the Bering Sea. And you can see the waves that are kind of lined up right now in the pattern. But there is also a large ridge sitting here, and that is the major feature preventing California from picking up much precipitation here without that strong subtropical component of the jet stream. Now, why does this continue to be the source region of a lot of our systems? Well, part of that answer, just part of it, is actually way up in the upper levels of the atmosphere. And now let's just go get a quick recap of what's going on with the polar vortex. It's right here and it is relatively strong. Now remember, we've been discussing this a lot lately. Here is the average strength of the polar vortex. Let's just put a line through that. So when it's, when it's weakened and displaced, that's when we tend to have big colder outbreaks. It's not. It's currently way up here. So we'll have to watch for it to plummet down here at some point, you know, later on in December or in January, February, for there to be, you know, one of those substantial multi-day colder outbreaks. But I'll tell you right now, the polar vortex remains relatively strong. From there, though, watch what this pattern is going to do. And I think this is a unique view of it to explain to you really the disconnect between where the really cold air is and what's going to be coming across the United States. So as I play this forward, let me show you what I'm talking about. Going out, we just noticed that just through this week, and I'll talk about the individual systems in a minute, but just look at this. You can see that there's troughing over, well, Greenland over Alaska, over the Bering Sea, there's lower atmospheric pressure over the Arctic. And as a result of that, look at how it even gets almost closed off here. And between that and the troughs that sweep through the United States, there's a disconnect. In other words, these two features aren't anchored together, which means when colder air comes through the U.S., it's not anchored to the really cold Arctic air. And as a result, uh, it's, it's going to be a quick shot at some cooler conditions. And as we move forward, we still see the trough sweeping through. There's no doubt about it. The pattern is active, but it's just not connected to the coldest air. And as I take you all the way out past day 10, even let's just keep going. Let's go out to day 15 here. We once again see that things really seem to be centered and starting here. And with the higher heights that run through parts of Canada and this positive PNA pattern we see developing over the West, uh, that could put some cooler weather compared to average over the Southeast, maybe wetter along the East Coast into week two. But this is just not a pattern that brings in bitterly cold air. And we need to talk about that.
So precipitation first, though. Over the next week, what are we looking at? We'll take a look at the northern U.S. Uh, plains and the southern Canadian prairies. Drier conditions in through here. Remember, no strong subtropical jet stream flow. It's drier across the southwest. But there are two separate systems running through the central part of the United States that will head toward the northeast. And there is the potential for some severe weather down here to the south. And so we certainly need to be talking about that. So last night, there's the snow I was telling you about that was pulling through parts of Ontario into Quebec. And then here's the frontal boundary that since moved through. Getting to early this morning, that system now pulls on off to the north and east. So what we're going to do is we're going to watch the next system behind it. So scattered snow showers here coming through the northwest. But our next system taking shape here in the middle part of the country will be doing so by midday today. Working our way into this evening, you start to see the chances for some snow Monday evening pulling through parts of Iowa. Very cold rain, might even get a little bit of a mix in through here. But the deeper trough is still back. It's still back here, cutting through the four corner states. So as that light snow moves through in the overnight hours and pushes here into parts of northern Illinois, Wisconsin, southern Minnesota, and out of Iowa, you're going to see the back side of this here, snow coming into the Rocky Mountains here in Colorado. So here we are at 8 a.m. on Tuesday morning. The snow then pushes through Wisconsin into Michigan, and now our low begins to take shape here by Tuesday evening. Now, as this low comes out here, we'll get some snow on the back side of it, but I'm concerned about the chances for some strong to severe storms to the south. It's going to spread a pretty chilly rain out ahead of it here across this section of the country and then snow moving into this part of Ontario. So this is system number one. With system number one, there is the risk as we go into the day tomorrow and then into the day on Wednesday of some severe weather. And our severe weather index is picking up on this. Notice as we work our way through Tuesday, you can start to see that the model is starting to show good conditions in through here for the potential for strong to severe storms. So again, this is working through Tuesday night into the overnight hours and then out into the day on Wednesday. And so through the day on Wednesday, you're just going to see a corridor open up and through here with a little bit of instability, but some strong wind shear and, of course, a front. And so Tuesday, the threat is here for storms, and Wednesday, it's right into this area. And you can see that reflected in the Storm Prediction Center maps. From there, though, let's go to the European and watch how this all takes shape. So playing this forward, we've already seen through this point. This is now Wednesday morning. So we have one system coming into the northwest. You can see what it's doing here with the snow at higher elevation and rain in coastal Oregon and Washington. But here's the low we're going to watch take shape on Wednesday morning. By Wednesday afternoon, I'll be keeping a close eye in the lower Mississippi River Valley for the potential for the strong to severe storms. That low then pulls through Illinois and goes up toward the lower part of Michigan here. It's going to be quite windy around this. And again, potential here for some strong to severe storms from Tennessee all the way down to Louisiana. That is going to be Wednesday night. By the time we get to Thursday morning, so this will be Thanksgiving, Thursday afternoon and evening, that system pulls toward the north and east. So scattered showers all along the south here through this area. And it's going to be a wetter day here in the northeast. Drier behind this, though, as you get into Thursday evening. Now, when does system two emerge? Well, the next trough comes sweeping through. This is now Friday afternoon getting into Friday evening. So we're going to watch here again for the chance for showers and storms, Texas, Louisiana, Arkansas, Mississippi. This is out ahead of the next load that develops on Saturday morning. See it there? Saturday afternoon and evening. Now on the back side of this one, you're going to notice that there's actually two separate lows. There's a low that just went through the parts of the Canadian Prairie. See it up here? This is, again, late Saturday night. So stronger winds and some snows here in parts of Saskatchewan and uh, Manitoba. But the system to the south of it here, let's go from Sunday morning into Sunday afternoon and evening. You can see not only is the system quite strong, but we're going to get some uh, snow on the back side of this. So there'll be enough cold air here that we're going to watch this area for snow. Again, on Sunday, chance for storms here to the south. And this whole system, very tight pressure gradient and quite windy. So that pulls through. And I'll be honest with you, if this forecast verifies, this will be criteria here for almost blizzard with the winds that you're going to see in this area. And I hate having to say that word looking out here at uh, next Sunday night. But this is what we're looking at from the latest run. So when I see that, I start to question, is this going to come into fruition? And so to answer that question, I'm going to look at the ensemble. What I notice here is that looking out to next Sunday evening, that the models are right now honing in on this area for putting in a low. So what you saw is the operational putting it right in through here with the snow on the back side. And the ensemble members 
are in agreement, which means you're going to need to watch this very carefully. So right now, just through the end of this week, so this is through Thanksgiving evening, what are we looking at in terms of total snowfall accumulation? Well, this is what you've got here, okay? What if we add in the second system? This is now what you've got. So again, this is the operational run only, and we're not looking at amounts. We're looking at the placement of the heaviest snow corridor, which is looking right in through here and also in this region as well. Pacific Northwest, this is very typical for us this time of year. But what is the probability of getting at least three inches by the time we get to Sunday evening? Well, you can see there is a corridor in through there where the probabilities are at least above zero with much higher values here in the Rockies and in central Wisconsin and this part of Michigan. That second system, though, look at what it does here in parts of Saskatchewan uh, in Manitoba getting over to Ontario. So that's your snowfall outlook through next Sunday evening. From there, I want to show you the pattern as we get in fully into the start of the month of December. This is a positive PNA pattern. What I mean there is there's a trough here and a ridge across the western part of the United States, and there's a downstream trough here over the southeast. So what does that mean? Uh, that means you're going to get a precipitation pattern like this. So as you build into that ridge, it's going to be wet in British Columbia, but drier across the west. And where the trough is lingering in this area, wetter conditions from Texas up to the northeast. That's what the operational European model is picking up on at this point. From there, let's go over to talk about temperatures as we get toward the end of this video. Just want to show you how far we have seen extend to the south our first frosts uh, of the year. So wherever you see white, we have yet to get a temperature below freezing. And keeping in line with this, I would like to talk about what our current soil temperatures are looking like because there will be people across the Corn Belt especially looking getting some fall in hydrous application done. So again, on this map, this is 7 a.m. So you got a hard break here at 32 degrees, but there's a broad sector in through here where the day time temperatures are getting back up above 32 but below 50 so I expect there to be quite a bit of field work in this area. National Digital Forecast Database high temperatures are the numbers. The color coding tells you the difference from normal. So as we go from Monday here into this week, here's what Tuesday is going to shape up looking like. Getting now into Wednesday, so this is the day before Thanksgiving, relatively mild pattern across much of North America here. Just a few pockets of cooler weather. And then this will be Thanksgiving Day right here. So where the next trough is digging in, remember, so cool in parts of the Intermountain West, but overall, a milder pattern for much of the rest of the United States and quite warm in parts of Texas. Friday, Saturday, now getting into Sunday. So that just takes you through your next week looking at those temperatures. Beyond that, here is the day 5 through 10 pattern. Remember the disconnect I was talking about? Well, look at the mild conditions it's putting into parts of Canada. And we're cooler down here, okay, to the south of it as those troughs sweep through to end uh, uh, November and begin December. Days um, 10 through 15. Remember, the pattern was going over to this, right? So the ridge was here. The trough tucked away down in this area. And both the European and the GFS painting a very, very similar picture. And it's a major disconnect in that cold air over the Arctic with what's going on in the central part of North America. We're going to finish here with the MJO. You see, the MJO, according to the diagram, seems to have collapsed right here in the middle of null space. But I could make an argument that it's really over here in phase five and phase four. And that's critical for South America because it tends to produce drier conditions here and here this time of year if you're in phase four and five. Now, why am I making that distinction? Well, the trade winds right now are forecast to blow strongly out of the east here and meet some weaker westerly trade winds there. And so there's convergence, mass convergence in the lower levels here, and that's over phase four and five. You can actually see it in the upper levels too. The air's rising here where we have phase four or five and sinking in this area. That also gives us another area of rising motion. It's here uh, in the Amazon and not so much right down here in this part of Brazil. That's how this all pieces together in the tropics, just in a very broad brush way. So what does that give us? Well, this week, this upcoming week, very dry in this area. Now, we know that we've had some problems. I addressed this in Thursday's video in Mato Grosso, Mato Grosso do Sol, over the last 30 days with some drier time periods causing some replant. Where it's going to be wet is to the south of that. There's a frontal boundary moving through parts of um, Argentina. And yes, the models have been going back and forth on the amounts. But if I take those drawings up there, this has been the general pattern we've seen. And it seems to want to last into week two. And I think December is going to be a month 
that is going to favor drier conditions in this area from just the latest guidance that I have, drier in through here, and that could be critical for what's happening down in South America. We'll keep a close eye on it, keep reporting back to you, okay? Have a great week, and we'll talk to you again soon. Thank you.